Here we are back again, Mel and Jay, 3,000 miles apart. And this time, Mel's going to introduce another sub-theme of what we've been going through. Always, we've been looking at the standard Islamic narrative, as I am. Standard Islamic narrative has always said that nobody can pray to Muhammad's tomb. Anathema, haram. And that this has been in place since the time of Muhammad himself. So the standard Islamic narrative from the 9th and 10th century has always instituted that it is haram, it is sinful, it, 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 well, this is idolatry. You do not pray at anybody's tomb and certainly not Muhammad's tomb. And nobody has ever questioned that. Well, Mel's going to question it. And the reason why he's going to question it, he's going to do what he's always done so well. He is going to go look at the historical record. And he's going to look at buildings. He's going to look at inscriptions. He's going to look at writings to see if this was the case at the beginning of the 7th and 8th and on century. And when, if this was, uh, if this was haram, let's just see if the historical record supports that. Perfectly innocent question to ask, yet perfectly important question to ask because we are in almost everything that mel and joe and paul and uh, odon and, and we're going to be introducing thomas and murad have all found in almost every case whenever we look at the standard islamic narrative we have found it to prove be proving wanting and to be proving wrong so here we go again one other tomb in this case to shut down and uh, and he's gonna i think he was gonna call it the slow road to a dead end so over to you, Mel. Tell us what you found. Right. So um, the slow road to a dead end. Um, I can't resist a good pun. Um, you probably will recognize this building here, the Taj Mahal. Yes, I've been but, there many times. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, perhaps our audience will not be familiar with this place here. Um, in fact, I wasn't either. Uh, this used to exist right up to the 20th century and it got destroyed. Oh, and I suppose, not, hold on a minute, not, not the Taj Mahal, you're talking about the one... No, this, this building to the right, I'm going to reveal this uh, building later, I'm just going to, it's a bit of a teaser, um, but um, the story I'm going to be uh, revealing with you has got a number of key progressions. So if, if we look at the story arc, as it were, um, it tells a very different tale to what the standard Islamic narrative would have us believe. Uh, Ibn Jubair, writing in the 13th century, describes the beautiful mausoleums in Medina. Then An Nawawi, uh, again writing a little bit later in the 13th century, not only describes these uh, mausoleums, but describes how visitors to Muhammad's grave pray to him, seeking his intercession before Allah. So, in other words, Muhammad, I, I never realized this, but Muhammad for them, was an intercessor, like a demigod, that uh, a mediator between God and hu the human race. So that's quite a, a shocker, quite a surprise. And then Ibn Taymiyyah, in the, who lived from 1263 to 1328, he denounces the visitation of Muhammad's grave. Ibn uh, Abdul Wahab, uh, in the 18th century, takes up these ideas uh, again and creates a movement uh, which became the Wahhabi movement, uh, which the, um, the Saudi government have um, taken on until very recently. Um, and they have spread these Wahhabist ideas right around the Muslim world. And then in 1806 and again in 1925, following an earlier reconstruction, the Wahhabis destroyed the mausoleums in Medina only Muhammad's grave was spared. So this is where we're heading. So what's interesting is there's quite a difference between the early part where Muslims were quite happy to visit these mausoleums, which existed for about a thousand years or more. And then later on, suddenly, not suddenly, but gradually over time, um, there was a change in view uh, of, of the idea of going to these graves, praying towards uh, the grave of Muhammad and other people uh, associated with him and asking for his intervention before God or his intercession, I should say, before God. Don't know if you want to jump in on any of that, Jay? No, this is good because what you're bringing up, and this is something we've always known, that it is with Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah in the 1300s, so the 14th century, along with Al-Wahhab who comes in the 1700s, 
uh, 18th century, both of them are known as the father of radicalism. Radicalism, and remember, it's Ibn Taymiyyah that what says that in order to be a good Muslim, you must read the book, follow the man. The book being the Quran, Muhammad would be the man. So he was the one that would have been confronting this whole idea of bowing down to tubes, because that goes against the book and it goes against the man, supposedly. Wahhab was the one then that picked that up and caught and created uh, his name, was then given to the namesake that has, that, that has now uh, his whole ideology of Wahhabism, which is now rampant all over the world because of the petrodollars of the Saudi Arabians who are dependent on him for their theological, their theological authority. So it stands to reason that these two names, and you brought them up, are the ones who have confronted this idea. But look at the dates, look at the dates. 1328 and 1792 are the death dates for both these men. With that understanding, then you can then see that in 1800s and then 1925, they went around and then they destroyed these mausoleums. And that is still continuing today. What did ISIS do? What did the Taliban, the ones who are now who have just taken over uh, Afghanistan, look and see what they did in, uh, when they were in power over 20 years ago? They, what, they destroyed those Buddhist statues. You remember them? They just, that, so this is still being carried on today. But is that a later, is that, and what you're asking, the question is, when did that, when was that introduced? I would suggest those dates you have on the screen there is when that is introduced, not the 7th and not the 8th century. Now, am I jumping the gun? Maybe I'm not. Maybe I am. No. But it's fascinating that you brought up the two names that I would have brought up as supports for this anathema or this attack against or uh, anything that's idolatrous or, in this case, uh, the tombs. Yeah, so what I would say is that these tombs and the fact that Muslims are recorded to have visited these tombs and prayed towards the graves of people like Muhammad. That suggests that, that this was a belief held by possibly a large number of Muslims. It was a practice which they, they were in the habit of doing for centuries. These tombs supposedly go way back to the beginning. Uh, now, I would suggest it probably wasn't the 7th century. It may have, uh, they may have been built in the 8th and 9th century. But nonetheless, we're talking about a good thousand years, if not more, where Muslims were visiting these places. And you have to imagine the reaction when these tombs were destroyed. This caused a major furore in the Muslim world at the time. This was not a popular action at the time. Um, maybe later, it might have been viewed, like later in the 20th century, it might have been viewed differently because, as you, as you mentioned, the, the Saudis were propagating these uh, more extreme views, but in the early days, these extreme views were more um, rarer and more the, um, not the mainstream, but the, um, how would we say, the kind of extreme view, let's put it that way. The what we would call the extreme right or radical right. Yeah. So uh, to begin with some basic stuff, what's a mausoleum? Um, I've got this definition here, which is pretty good. It's a stately or impressive building housing a tomb or group of tombs. The great effort gone into building these mausoleums suggests these are intended to be visited. I think that's a reasonable um, assumption. Now, the most famous mausoleum in the world is probably the Taj Mahal. Uh, in my ignorance, put my hand up, I, I used to think when I saw this, because I, and I saw that it was in India, I assumed that this must be a Hindu temple. <laughs> I, you know, not a, uh, not a great thing to admit, um, but it was only really when I looked into it and uh, it was pointed out to me, no, actually, this was uh, created by a Muslim. I was like, what? Uh, it looks so, That's so much like it. That was built by Shah Jahan for his wife. Uh, and it, yeah. it was, actually, he was supposed to be also have been buried there as well. She is buried there. He was then taken over by his son and put into the Red Fort across the river on the other side and could only watch it from a little mirror about this big as a reflection as it was being finished off. And when you see that, it is, well, there's no other building in the world that is quite that beautiful or as yeah. symmetrical as that. And it's one of the great uh, seven wonders of the world today. If yeah. you ever get to India, go see it. But if this is interesting on that very point. If you go around northern India, it's all northern India, the best architecture are always Mughal. This is called Mughal architecture, which is Islamic architecture. Yeah, Because of the fact they could not put their creative juices into any other area like paintings and other things like that because that was seen as haram, they put it into calligraphy and they put it into buildings like this. And in almost every case, these were primary, the best ones, the best examples of them were always tombs. Okay, so you can, you can read that uh, description there for yourselves. We're just going to move on from there. 
So this at first glance seems surprising as Hadiths teach that such places are not allowed and visiting graves is strictly forbidden. So take this example here. It was narrated from Abu Herrera said, the messenger of Allah said, if one of you were to sit on a live coal that burns him, that would be better for him than if he were to sit on a grave. So sitting on a grave is symbolic of visiting a grave or praying at a grave. And so there are hadiths like that, which are strictly against the, this idea. This is part of the standard Islamic narrative. And uh, we have here Abu Martad al Ganawi reported Allah's messenger as saying, do not sit on the graves and do not pray facing towards them. This is from Sahih Muslim. And another one, do not pray facing towards the graves and do not sit on them. Again, Sahih Muslim. And we, I won't read all of these, but as you can see here, may Allah curse the Jews and Christians for they built the place of worship at the graves of their prophets. Um, and again, may Allah's curse be on the Jews for they built the places of worship at the graves of their prophets. And so if we take all of that into account, if the Hadiths were authentic and early, we'd expect that there, there to be no Muslims either for Muhammad or his nearest relatives, right? So that seems logical. If the Hadiths, as, as, as often suggests, come from the 7th century onwards, 8th century, um, surely there'd be none of these, especially in the most important place in Islam's geography, which would be places like Mecca and Medina. But that's not the case. Ibn uh, Jubair, 1145-1217, describes the tombs at al-Baqi as he saw it during his travel to Medina. He says, the grave of Hassan bin Ali, situated near the gate to its right hand, has an elevated dome over it. His head lies at the feet of Abbas bin Abdul Mutalib, and both graves, graves are raised high above the ground. The walls are panelled with yellow plates. I just put gold with a question mark. Um, that's me, not, not the original. And studded with beautiful star-shaped nails. Um, and you can see there's the source where I got that from. Please note that this was in Medina, arguably the geographical heartland of Islam. These tombs existed for 1,000 years, visited by countless generations of Muslims, and it was only in the 19th and 20th century that they were finally destroyed by supposed traditionalists. But the real tradition really is the fact that these existed for 1,000 years, visited by literally millions and millions of Muslims over the centuries. Now, um, and now Huawei, uh, a little bit later in that same century, in the section devoted to visiting Muhammad's grave that is found in his book on pilgrimage, and there's the title of it, which I'm not going to attempt to, to repeat. The visitor stands and greets the prophet, then he moves to greet Abu Bakr and Umar. Then he returns to his original position, directly in front of Allah's messenger, and he's referring to the grave of Muhammad, and he uses the prophet as his means in his innermost self, and he seeks his intercession before his exalted and mighty Lord. And one of the best things that he can say is what has been narrated by our colleagues on Al Utbi's authority, and they admired what he said. As I was sitting by the grave of the prophet, a Bedouin Arab came and said, Peace be upon you, O Messenger of Allah. I've heard Allah saying, If they had only when they were unjust to themselves, come to thee and ask Allah's forgiveness, and the messenger had asked forgiveness for them, they would have found Allah indeed oft returning most merciful. So I've come to you asking forgiveness for my sin, seeking your intercession with my Lord. So you see what they're doing here is they are going to the grave of Muhammad, asking Muhammad to intervene before Allah to get Allah's mercy and Allah's forgiveness. So they couldn't go directly to Allah. They have to go through um, the, the dead body of Muhammad, essentially, to ask for um, his intercession. Any thoughts or reactions to that, um, Jay? Well, that, that, I mean, that, that stands directly and con uh, contrary to Islamic belief and certainly against the standard Islamic narrative 
and anybody who any Muslim who's reading this would shudder in disbelief that this would be something that is being written in, in this case the 13th century the, uh, that late and yet there it is it's from Anawi himself so it looks like this practice was quite prevalent well, certainly up until the 13th century yeah and I would say that to me it, it seems more likely that this came first this practice was probably from the earliest days and the Hadiths are a redaction uh, in reaction to this practice that they're trying to eliminate because it's clearly a theological embarrassment in, in later centuries um, because they are trying to present Islam as a monotheistic religion and yet people are going to the, the grave of Muhammad and uh, asking for his intercession which places Muhammad as somewhere between a human and God perhaps like a demiurge or a, a demigod um, so obviously this is embarrassing and they're trying to get rid of this. Uh, and when you say embarrassing, time. for those just to, just so people know what you're mm -hmm. talking about, and we've talked about this in earlier episodes, what this is suggesting is when you look at this, this if this is happening in the 1300s and the traditions are from the 9th and 10th century, it looks like the 9th and 10th century traditions which confront this are not written in the 9th and 10th century, but must be written much, 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 much later, as we're going to find out. And we have said it already on our programs we don't have any originals of Al-Buhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Daud, Tirmidhi, or even, even Ibn Isham or Al-Wakiri or Al-Dabari. We don't have any of the originals at all. They, are all. they are all from copies. The earliest manuscripts we have for any of these don't really appear. Uh, well, one appears in the 11th century, just one of the nine volumes. The others appear in the 15th and 16th century. So it looks like even what we call Al-Buhari and Sahih Muslim and all these Hadith writers from the 9th century, we've always dated them 870, 875 and whatnot, late 9th century. We don't even know if that is correct anymore. It could well be from what you're suggesting here. We know that these would have, they would have to have been written after this period. This is the 13th century. And it looks like probably this is this theology of uh, that is against the tombs and worshiping in tombs was something that was introduced in the 15th and 16th century. Yeah, I, like, thing is, once you have uh, a book, you can always add extra hadiths whenever you want, you know. So even if we allow, um, grant them that Al-Bukhari was written in the century that is supposed to be written, that doesn't preclude extra parts being added later. Because, like, I think you mentioned in one of the earlier videos that, you know, we, we can find an early volume of his, his work, but in terms of the nine volumes... We can only find the full collection. I think is it the 19th century? So no, we get the 16th century is when the other eight are then uh, that we we are able to trace it back to. I mean, this is a whole yeah. area that we haven't really unpacked yeah. on our uh, in our channel yet. And we need to do this, and maybe we need uh, Mel. This may be something that you and I can really uh, do, and that is when yeah. do these standard Islamic narratives? We're always play, claiming them for 9th century. When do we find that they're, they're the first manuscripts for any of these materials? We've talked about yeah. this on the Quran. We've gone through that the manuscript for the Quran is in and of itself troubling because they don't even begin to appear till 705 and later. Why aren't we doing the same thing with the Hadith? Because the Hadith, though, are claimed from 9th century, the, the manuscript for the Hadith do not appear, except for the one volume in the 11th century. The others don't appear until the 15th and 16th century. Yeah. Okay. So... Was uh, Anne Nawawi uh, unaware of those hadiths that prohibited praying facing towards graves? It's, it seems odd um, that he could be unaware. He ought to have been aware if such hadiths existed, as he was a Sunni Safite jurist and hadith scholar. So, if like you can't get more expertise than that in, in terms of hadiths, so why is he contradicting the hadiths if these hadiths actually existed? those particular hadiths. Such prohib prohibitions seem to have been first proposed by another jurist who was influential after him, Ibn Taymiyyah. However, his innovative ideas were rejected at the time, and it was only in a much later period that they were taken up again by Ibn Abdul uh, Wahab. Now, it's interesting that uh, Ibn Taymiyyah's ideas were so um, radical and so different to what the public um, believed in that it got him in trouble. Um, so, for example, here, let me just jump to this point here. Um, Ibn Tamiya spent a large portion of his life in prison for his teachings. His last imprisonment was caused by his issuance of a legal opinion 
reportedly denouncing the visitation of the prophet's grave. Um, so it's hard to believe um, that there was an earlier hadith that prohibited um, the visiting of graves, because why would people react so strongly to this novel teaching if this was actually just representative of what people always believed? Um, his ideas seem to be so out there that people thought his ideas were dangerous. They were bidder, I think the word is, um, a, a novelty. And, you know, he says it is obligatory to destroy the structure constructed over the grave. And after gaining power for their destruction, it is not permissible to reinstate them even for one day. So the people reacted really badly to that. They did. They considered him way too radical and, uh, and, and he didn't have popular support for his ideas. Now, um, Ibn Tamiya was defeated by his opponents, the ulama of Egypt and Syria, and died in prison together with his legal opinions, condemning grave visitation and the belief in intercession. Despite his failure to prevail in his lifetime, however, Ibn Tamiya left an influential legacy for subsequent generations who in the following centuries still imp impelled to engage in similar debate, whether in refutation of his arguments or in defense of them. His spiritual legacy found a fertile ground in the person of al-Wahhab and has also been appropriated by today's Salafis. So this is really key in terms of understanding um, what's going on in today's Islam. However, it took a long time before Ibn Taymiyyah's ideas in the 14th century would be taken up again and then put into action in the 19th and 20th century. In all, it took 500 years before his ideas led to the destruction of mausoleums dedicated to Muhammad's closest companions and very nearly led to Muhammad's grave being destroyed. And now I just put a little note there. These are presumed by Muslims to be their graves. Again, that's, that's conjecture. That's a presumption. We don't know for certain who are in these graves, but we'll grant them the, the presumption. Um, but it took a long time before um, people thought of actually destroying these mausoleums. And uh, this is a picture of the mausoleums. Uh, this is, I think this picture is from the 19th century, possibly the early 20th century. As you can see, there's quite a lot of them. Um, some large mausoleums and then smaller tombs on the ground. And uh, this was Janet al-Baki in Medina. Historical records show that there were domes, cupolas and mausoleums there um, before the 20th century. Today, it is a bare land without any buildings. And here are, as I say, some of the... Um, people that are supposed to have been buried there. It's kind of a who's who of early Islam, according to the Sen. Um, you can see uh, Fatima, Uthman, apparently, um, the wives of the Prophet and so on. And yet they decided that they're going to destroy the uh, tombs of these really important people, which is, seems very odd indeed. So Al-Baki Cemetery, the oldest and one of the two most important Islamic graveyards located in Medina in current day Saudi Arabia, was demolished in 1806 and following reconstruction in the mid 19th century was destroyed again in 1925. In 1925, Medina surrendered to the Wahhabi onslaught. All Islamic heritage were, uh, sorry, was destroyed. The only shrine that remained intact was that supposed to be that of Muhammad. And that was a last minute decision. They actually went out there uh, intending to destroy even Muhammad's um, tomb. But um, the, the reaction was, was so hostile there to that, um, to avoid um, certain bloodshed, they, they stopped short in terms of destroying uh, his tombstone, or his uh, tomb, I should say. Uh, Wahhabis tried to carry out the demolition within a legal religious context since they regarded the shrines as idolatrous and believed that marking graves is bidda, heresy based on their interpretation of Quranic verses regarding graves and shrines. They drew from the story of the golden calf found in the Quran, where Israelites manufactured idols and prayed to them, causing God to become angry. Some Muslims see the story as a blanket prohibition 
against the worship of images and shrines. Now, if we assume that they're correct in that interpretation, why then were these tombs there for over a thousand years? Um, you know, it seems odd. Um, now, on the other hand, Shia scholars used a number of different verses and traditions to support the practice of building shrines over the graves of Islamic saints. According to Shia scholar Muhammad Jafar Tabasi, the graves of Shia imams buried in al-Baqi had been revered for hundreds of years and none of the Sunni scholars regarded the shrines as innovation. So my question to the audience is, which came first, the idolatrous shrines or the prohibition? I don't know if you want to come in on that, Jay. Well, this is fascinating. I mean, you're you're bringing up here something that I had never thought of before, and this is exciting by looking and seeing when the tombs were there, and the fact that the Shia have a different. Uh, the Shia, interestingly, it's the Shia who still go to tombs today, and it's the Shia who ISIS spent most of their times attacking. It was the I, the Shia tombs in Iraq and in Syria that they destroyed. And we saw the pictures of them. They were one after another was being destroyed because the Shia have this practice of going to tombs. They uh, they would this would be another theological difference between the Shia and the, and the and and the Sunnis. But I had no idea that these tombs were that plentiful from the picture you're showing, and I had no idea also that they were destroyed so recently. I had no idea that this was only happening in 1806 and 1925, very very recently, or the fact that. This whole idea of tombs being bidda was something that was not was was not from the ninth and tenth century. So this is new for me, Mel. Thank you for doing this because you're proving you're proving just by looking at the the, the, the context and looking at the, what's written, and also by looking at the buildings. And we've always said, look at the buildings. That this is a much much later rendition, probably begun by Ibn Taymiyyah, but then not accepted during his lifetime. Made significant than by the Wahhabis from uh, Muhammad ibn al Abd al-Wahhab from the 1700s. And of course, Wahhabism, as we well know, is at the foundation of most of your radical movements today. Yeah. Okay, so a summary then. I, I think when we look at it from bird's eye view again, I think it's really clear um, which came first. I, I would suggest that this practice of visiting tombs was something that existed right back in the early days. The tombs um, existed even long before Ibn Jubair um, spoke about the, the beautiful mausoleums in Medina. Um, so he was from the 13th century. Um, and and Nawi, um, I probably said that wrong, um, a little bit later than him, he, he goes into detail further and, and, and describes how Muslims prayed uh, towards the grave of Muhammad, asking for his intervention, which doesn't sound very Islamic to me, you know, judging that uh, from today's standard Islamic narrative. Um, and then we have a little bit later than that, we have Ibn Taymiyyah, who's basically denouncing this practice. And then Wahhab in the 18th century, he's basically taking up these ideas again. And then finally, we have just as, as little as we're talk only talking about, what is it, 94 years ago, when the, these tombs were finally demolished for good. So as you can see, this is like the complete reversal of how we've understood it, that you know, we were told, and we have been told for years, that the Hadiths come from the, the 7th and 8th century and so on, and the 9th century, and that these were clear that you shouldn't visit a grave. And, and right in the middle of... Arabia in Medina, one of the most important cities, in fact, the second most important city after Mecca, they have all of these tombs. Where are all of the protesting Muslims for a thousand years? Think about all of the great Muslims down through the centuries, all the scholars and so on. How come they're not even raising a Ferrari? They're not even saying anything about it until we have Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, raising a fuss, but uh, what happened to all the others? Why, why were they not saying anything against it? I would suggest it's because there was no hadith that said anything against this until till later. Maybe the first hadith was um, inspired by Ibn Taymiyyah rather than the other way around. But um, that's that's my take on it. I'll come back to you, Jay. Listen, here you. I don't know whether whether you know it or not, but you introduce a whole new genre. 
Have you seen what you're doing? We have now looked at the mosques. We have looked at the inscriptions. We have looked at the coins. You have looked at the paintings and statues. And now here comes a fifth one, the tombs. Of tombs and temples, but tombs in this case. No one's looked at tombs before. And you say, let's just follow the evolve, let's just follow the evolution of something as simple as tombs. What are tombs for? Well, tombs are places where you remember people. That's why we have graveyards. That's why we all have, well, many of us have graveyards. And tombs were the same thing. And when you remember people, then you acknowledge them. Then as a, after a while, they get knowledge, especially if it's a great person and somebody who's important to you, you then go to them. And then you also just don't, you don't just do a puja there. You also start asking them for intercession. So that progression of intercession does take place. And you looked at that by looking at the, the, the writings and especially on, on Nawawi. Nawawi. Uh, I'm glad you use on the Nawawi because he is important to this whole discussion. When he says that this is the reason they went to tubes. Well, you then said, well, when did this be, when, did, when was this uh, confronted? Well, according to the standard Islamic narrative, this was confronted by Muhammad himself. This was confronted from the very beginning. This was anathema, and that's why the Hadith are so much against the idea of going to tombs, because that is shirk. You're now elevating a person who is dead alongside God, because if you're after asking for intercession, then you're asking for something that only God can do, only God can permit, and that is intercession. That is, to, that is a deity can do that. So you're elevating Muhammad to almost de divine status, which I can understand is a problem, theologically speaking. But this did not happen at the time of Muhammad, nor did it happen during the ninth century when this the hadith were being written down by Al-Buhari Sahih Muslim Ibn Dawud in 870, 875, and on up till Al-Tabari in 923. That did not happen in the ninth and tenth century because you're giving an Nanawi and you're giving these references that are from the 1300s. And that you're also saying that this even was considering this was still there because the tombs, you look at the picture and say the tombs were still there all the way until the 19th century, until the 1800s, especially the ones in Medina. And I, it was a great picture you have of the whole number of tombs there. I've never seen those tombs before. Well, there's a reason I've not seen those tombs. They have now subsequently been destroyed. So the idea of that Ibn Taymiyyah in the 1300s, 14th century, confronts this, uh, this practice, saying that it's bitter, saying that this is wrong. He gets persecuted. He gets put into prison. And so because he gets put in, he dies in prison. So it did take off that early. But he is the one that gives the groundwork. And when I, listen, I've been working with radicals my, almost my entire ministry. For 30 years, I've been working with radicals. And when you talk to a radical Muslim, they always mention Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah is the grandfather of radicalism, they tell me all the time. But no, he just introduced it. Who is the one that actually put it to practice? It's Al-Wahhab in the 1700s. You bring up Wahhab. Thanks for doing that. Because Wahhab is the one that actually takes Ibn Taymiyyah and he puts it into categories that everybody could understand. And see, that didn't really take hold. Wahhabism was really remained in Saudi Arabia and did not really take hold until the 20th century. And the reason why Wahhabism then finally took hold was because of oil. Oil, wealth, then created Wahhabism and pushed Wahhabism right across the world. And that's why the Islamic, the Muslim Brotherhood in the 1920s and up to the 1940s, they're in Egypt, took Wahhabism and made it a practical application. And one of the first things they did is anything that is gets in the way of God, anything that commits shirk, anything that is to be worshipped or to bow down to or is intercessory, that, that, that is besides God, is bidah. That is haram. That is heresy. And so that's why the, the brother, the Islamic Brotherhood, coming out of Wahhabism, has then created that. Now, from that Muslim Brotherhood, take a look and see who are the main players in the Muslim Brotherhood. Well, you have Said Qutb, who wrote probably the best book in the shade of the Quran, also Milestone, that pretty took the Quran and did what Ibn Taymiyyah had done earlier, and also what uh, our good friend uh, um, Wahhab did in the 1700s. He did in between 1956 and 1966 that 10-year prison, that 10-year period while he was in prison. He wrote and showed how that is to be applied in the 20th century. That is the textbook. That is the textbook for all radical Muslims. And what does it say? Write carefully. It says over and over again, you do not associate anybody with God. Tombs should not, and he talks about tombs. I mean, you can go and read it. He does talk about tombs. And what's fascinating, he is the one that influenced Ayman Zawahidi. Ayman Zawahidi was his, well, his favorite student. Not only Ayman Zawahidi, look and see who is, and let me just get his name, um, Yusuf Karadawi. Yusuf Karadawi, who is on Al Jazeera television every night. He's there in Qatar. You can go see him, Al Jazeera television. He was a student of Asai Qutb. 
And he was from the Muslim Brotherhood. He's all, he is also from that same stable. So he's taking this Wahhabism, and he is the one that has had, Ayman Zawahiri is the one that, uh, that had influence over Osama bin Laden. And who are the ones that started attacking the tombs? And who are the ones that started attacking the, the statues? It was the Al-Qaeda that started doing that, who then influenced the Taliban. And the Taliban, who are the ones who destroyed those two Buddhas. And then who are the ones, it's Zarqawi, who comes from being trained up by uh, Ayman Zawahiri. It's Zarqawi who leaves Afghanistan, comes back to Iraq, and he is the one that influences Muhammad um, uh, by um, al Baghdadi. Muhammad ibn al Baghdadi. The Baghdadi is the creator and the instigator for ISIS. ISIS is the one that takes that theology coming out of yes Wahhabism, and he uses ISIS uses it to go all over Syria and all over Iraq, destroying one tomb after another. Look at the pictures from ISIS from 2014 to 2015. Tomb after tomb after tomb is destroyed. You have brought a whole new genre here that I never thought of until you just brought it up just now. What we're seeing even today as we speak, and what we're going to see from here on out, anytime you see a radical Muslim, Sunni Muslim attacking tombs and shrines, they are following not the traditions of the 9th and 10th century. They're not even following anything from the 12th and 13th century. They are following what Wahhab started instigating, instituting, coming out of Taimiyah from the 14th century in the 18th century. But that the practice is then created in, as you say, the two dates are 1806 and 1925. That's where the tombs were being destroyed. It is still happening today. Oh, I love this because you can just run with this, Mel. This is exciting yeah. because you're bringing up a genre that I've never thought of before. Yeah. Uh, here's the thing. People may not get the reason why they're destroying the tombs. The reason why they must destroy the tombs is because they need to hide the early history of Islam. That's its number one purpose. And the work that we are doing in terms of exposing that early history, this is their greatest nightmare because they are, they, the reason why they, they, they're you know, spending so much effort destroying all of these tombs is because it tells a different story. It breaks the standard Islamic narrative. They want people to believe that the Hadith started first and so on. I'm going to support what you've just said. Let me just show you this picture. Take a look at this picture here. Look at this is a picture of Mecca a few years ago. Look at all the cranes. Notice the two th arrows, and I'll just emphasize the two arrows. One arrow is pointing to Khadija's house. The other arrow is pointing to where Muhammad's birthplace, house. They have been destroyed to make way for all these skyscrapers. Why do you think they're destroying that? Exactly what Mel's saying. They have to destroy the evidence. They have to destroy any place that, can be, that could be used as a place of devotion. As someone as important as Khadija, the wife of Muhammad, the first wife of Muhammad, to destroy her house, they have to destroy anything that could be worshipped or anything that would be that would consider it to be haram. Fascinating. Love this. This is going to be fun because from here on out, we've got to see where this progresses. We're introducing a new genre. Mel didn't even know that he's introducing a new genre. Let's follow it through and see if these tombs actually are, the destruction of tombs is something that came much, much, much later, not as the standard Islamic narrative says from the time of Muhammad. This probably was introduced by Ibn Taymiyyah in 1300s, made into a practical application as a theological position in the 1700s by Ibn Wahhab, then started to be put into practice by the Wahhabis in 1806 and also 1925. And now we're seeing it being put into practice by almost every radical group that we come across today. But it has nothing to do with Muhammad. It has nothing to do with the 7th century. And it has nothing to do with the origins of Islam. God bless you. Thanks so much, Mel. This has been fun. This is going to go back now. Force people, you're, you may want to argue, may want to get confront us. You may want to also disagree with us. You've got the comments below, and we will certainly read them. I'll let Mel uh, try to respond to them as best he can. And then we might, may have to come back and redress it and even uh, put some new categories. Or even if you find other tombs that have been destroyed, please let us know. Because we need to inflate this genre to bring it to the fore, because it's going to be a whole nother study that's going to take off from here. God bless you. It's been so good having you. Mel, thanks again. It's fun Thank just you. keeping up with you. I love what you find. <laughs> over there in Ireland, here in the United States, Jane Mel, over and out. Mm -hmm.